Well, it is so nice to be with you all today. Thank you for coming to our FCC panel, our FCC policy panel. I would love to introduce our esteemed panelists and give them a chance to introduce themselves. So Angie, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Kelsey. And thank you for the opportunity to speak here at State of the Net on the 20th anniversary. Really exciting. I am Angie Cronenberg. I'm the president of Encompass. Encompass is a le the leading trade association that is representing new network builders, as well as online internet inter innovators. And I'm really looking forward to talking to you about our policy agenda for the year. We are focusing on bringing more broadband competition to consumers and to businesses, as well as ensuring that no matter which network provider you may choose, you can access the online content of your choice without undue interference from your bias provider, your broadband provider. So thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Looking forward to our conversation. Absolutely. Let's keep it going down the line. Good, uh, good afternoon. I'm Chris Lewis. I'm President and CEO of Public Knowledge. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, we're, Public Knowledge is a, a digital rights a nonprofit and civil society group here in DC. And uh, we are part of a large field of, of allies uh, working on behalf of the public interest. Um, uh, our mission is to promote free expression and an open internet and affordable access to communications tools and creative works. And that means a lot of work at the FCC. Great to hear it. You're in the right place. Uh, great, Diane. Please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you do. Thanks, Kelsey. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Diane Holland. I am a partner at Wiley Ryan here in DC. I am also currently serving as president of FCBA, the tech bar. So I have two full-time jobs, and I don't get a lot of sleep even when there's not a Super Bowl keeping me up late at night. Um, I spent a little over 20 years uh, as an FCC staffer. Uh, I just left uh, about a year ago, and so uh, much of my practice now is uh, advising clients about uh, FCC matters and, and helping them sort of navigate uh, rules and, and uh, processes at the agency. Uh, I'm an also enjoying uh, working on uh, a few uh, non-FCC issues, including uh, doing some uh, diversity and DEI counseling uh, in, in light of the recent Supreme Court uh, hearings, uh, uh, hearings, decisions that uh, uh, outlawed the use of race-based uh, decisions in, in college admissions. And so since those uh, rulings are sort of spilling out into the private sector, uh, I am uh, working uh, with a few clients in trying to sort of navigate and understand what those mean for private sector uh, employees. So uh, I'm, I'm having a lot of fun um, still doing FCC work, but also sort of branching out. Hi, uh, I'm Matt Brill. I'm a partner at Latham & Watkins, and I chair our a uh, group we call Connectivity, Privacy, and Information, which encompasses communications law, privacy, and data security, and copyright litigation. We have clients throughout the internet sector, uh, from broadband network owners to tech companies. Uh, my work at the FCC often uh, focuses on the broadband network providers, and in particular, I've done a lot of work for NCTA, the Inter Internet and Television Association, over the last um, number of years focusing on broadband classification and net neutrality issues, more recently on digital discrimination, both of which are hot topics I'm sure we'll talk about today. So uh, delighted to be here with you all. Fantastic. Well, um, let's jump right into it. As of September, the FCC is at critical mass, and um, we're lucky to have a full slate of commissioners now. It was lovely to see Commissioner Gomez um, speaking right before this, so she's kind of a tough act to follow. Um, unfortunately, I hate to break it to everybody, it's an election year if we weren't aware. Um, how much do we think the FCC can realistically get done before there's potentially a new administration in town? Um, who would like to take a shot at that? I can start. Um, I think I can get a lot done. So it was not ideal that it took a while to get the fifth FCC commissioner on board with the Biden administration. But once uh, she arrived, the agency really sped up the process and issued several notices of proposed rulemaking. Um, and so have really, we've started the process of some of what I would describe the more controversial issues, right? Which I know we'll get to. Um, in particular, 
On the deployment agenda, what Encompass has been very happy to see is action on some of the most basic needs of broadband providers in order to build their networks. As we just heard the commissioner discuss, you know, we have a massive investment going into the availability of broadband networks, which means we're, we have a lot of deployment that is underway, both what we describe as middle mile deployment as well as last mile deployment. And Encompass and several others have been advocating that we needed more clarification of the rules about accessing things like poles and conduit, things that put, I think, everybody to sleep when we're talking about how you deploy a network. But there are really important functions for telecommunications providers to be able to build their networks and access to poles and conduit it was one of them. And we saw them take action in December as well as tee up some additional opportunities for them to uh, address even larger builds by clarifying what the timelines are for providers who are gonna be doing these really significant builds as a result of the bead funding. So that's one area where we're already seeing action and I think additional action could happen, which we think is incredibly important for the overall internet and um, for all agenda that the Biden administration has. That's a great point, especially with um, infrastructure in general being such a hot topic and so much money flowing into it right now. Um, Chris. Yeah, I, I agree. I think there's a lot they can do, and, and it's a shame that sometimes, you know, uh, only the most controversial topics at the FCC get the attention. Um, you know, we're definitely watching the, the Title II proceeding, which I think is incredibly important uh, that they, they move quickly on. Uh, but there are many smaller things uh, uh, that happen at the FCC, and, and many of them through bipartisan votes. Um, uh, or, or even at the, at the bureau level. So like the declaratory ruling on AI and, and, um, and Robotech's uh, uh, just in, in, in the last few weeks uh, is an example of, I think, something that everyone can agree with, but clarified the law in a very simple way. That's important to have at an expert agency that can keep up with the pace of technology, technological change. Absolutely, yes. Um, Diane would love to hear from you. Sure, I, of course, uh, this chairwoman uh, has been very busy. Uh, she's had a very uh, robust uh, meeting just about every month. Uh, the last few months, there have been eight, meeting, eight items, 10 items. And so I think one of the differences you can see is prior to September, before Commissioner Gomez was confirmed and uh, two of the other uh, commissioners were also uh, uh, reappointed. But before that, the types of things that uh, the commission was able to do um, were slightly uh, different. And you can see uh, sort of a different bent uh, after September, the next uh, couple of months brought, of course, the net neutrality of the open internet proceeding, digital discrimination. Uh, and so uh, you saw things that she could get, of course, uh, the requisite number of votes on. And, and, and after that, you're seeing a lot of two, three, two votes. Interestingly, you're seeing three, two votes on notices of proposed rule, rulemaking as well, which are just asking questions. And so I, I don't think the pace slows at all. The pace probably speeds up, especially in light of this being uh, an election year. I served uh, at the commission through uh, three administration changes. Uh, I left for five years and came back, so I missed one of the administration changes. But And the same thing happens in an election year. You are trying to get as much done as you can because you don't know if you're going to have more of a chance after the election or if the administration changes, then the chair also changes and uh, the agenda uh, also changes. Yeah, in, in my experience, election years do change the focus of the FCC. There does tend to be a kind of stopping point for, for more controversial items. I mean, this, this is a commission that deserves credit under Chairwoman Rosenworcel. She and her colleagues, when the agency was 2-2, got a lot done. And there was a lot of consensus on consumer protection items with robocalls and robotechs and uh, spectrum items and other things. But I, I think the... The more controversial and divisive issues, we had one with digital discrimination, we will have another with the open internet proceeding. There just aren't going to be too many uh, of those. And I think, you know, we look back historically, there's peril for an administration sort of doing things too close to an election when we won't know the outcome. I remember when Chairman Wheeler presided over the commission uh, and launched a proceeding on business data services. And um, 
the, the election took a turn in, in 2016 that I don't think he expected and many others didn't expect. And, and Chairman Pai came in and the, the outcome in that proceeding was pretty much 180 degrees opposite of, of what Chairman Wheeler had intended. So that maybe is a cautionary tale for chairs, like launching proceedings uh, when there's just so much uncertainty about the future direction of the agency. Yeah, and we even saw that with um, uh, the election uh, where Chairman Wheeler led a, a, an effort to update privacy laws uh, for uh, the broadband age, and Congress came in and repealed those privacy laws. Uh, now we have Congress clamoring for privacy laws, so it, it, you know the swings of politics can really be damaging. And on the kind of opposite side of that question, if we don't see a new administration, how disruptive are you expecting this election cycle to be? I think your answer um, just now, Chris, kind of gets at that. Anyone want to uh, take a swing at that? How disruptive can the election be? Well, it, yes, yeah. <laughs> just in tech policy? Um, thanks for laughing. Um, <laughs> now, it, it, I, can, I think it can be, like, like the panel described, it can be destructive in the way that we don't move forward on, on big things. Um, and, and quite frankly, it can be challenging because uh, the FCC, uh, you know, with, with the experts who are deep diving deep into the issues, may be ready to move forward on something, but Congress may not be able to. And, and I think that can hold it back. Um, prime example, Congress hasn't renewed auction authority for uh, spectrum auction authority at the FCC. Um, and yet there's great work that could be done at the agency on spectrum. And there's traditionally been, again, a lot of uh, bipartisan support on how to get that done in a technical way that benefits uh, both licensed users and unlicensed users. Yeah, and, and Chris alluded to the Congressional Review Act uh, that allows uh, the next, that allows Congress to just overturn a rule that, that they uh, can get enough votes to, to do so. And um, even if the administration stays with the same party, there's no guarantee that Congress will. And of course, with Congress holding the purse strings of the FCC and having the power of the Congressional Review Act and other uh, steps that they can take to uh, uh, sway uh, an independent agency to, to act in ways that, that Congress uh, wants them to act, um, there can definitely be an impact uh, regardless of, of who's sitting in the, in the White House. Yeah, I, I think, you know, for me, it isn't about partisanship. It's just different ideologies. And when, when you look at Internet policy, the Republican-led FCC um, track record and Democratic-led FCC track record are just diametrically different because I think, without overgeneralizing, the Republican administrations have favored a more market-based, hands-off approach to Internet governance, and Democrats have favored you know, classification of broadband under Title II, really maximizing regulatory authority. And the most recent round of rulemaking efforts really doubles down on that, saying that it's not just about net neutrality, it's about national security, public safety, cyber, privacy. Um, you know, there's a long laundry list of, of areas where um, this, this administration at the FCC wants to assert oversight and control. So I, 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 don't, I don't think it's about disruption so much as it is, it's just consequential, because there, there are very profound differences in how the parties have approached these fundamental questions about internet governance. Well, let's turn to something that we're hearing a lot about from both sides of the aisle, um, the Affordable Connectivity Program. Obviously, the pandemic was a bad time for a lot of us in a lot of ways, but one of the positives that seems to have come out of it is the Affordable Connectivity Program. Uh, we heard the case for the ACP during Commissioner Gomez's speech um, just before this. Um, I ha actually had an outdated number. Um, I had the fact that 20 million households have been connected. Commissioner Gomez says we are up to 23 million households and counting now. So um, obviously that signals a huge impact on a lot of people getting connected, but the bad news is that that funding is obviously running out. So I would love to hear from you all um, on what you think about the prospects for the ACP being renewed and um, maybe you could talk a little bit about the hurdles um, that stand in the way of this program that does seem to have bipartisan support. This is a significantly important program. From the perspective of the new network builders, those who are gonna be participating in the upcoming BEAD program, 
um, it can lower their costs by up to 25% to build according to one study. You heard the commissioner discuss it in terms of, well, when, when you know that there's um, the potential for a customer that can pay, i.e. through the government, um, it does have give them more incentive to build as well as lowering their costs to build, which I think is fairly significant. Also, the fact that the bead program was tied to the ACP, there was an intent by Congress that the two would work hand in hand to deliver the network availability as well as the availability to afford it for low income families. So Encompass has been actively working the hill with many others on this panel and in this room to obtain additional funding from Congress to secure it at least for another year. And the estimates are we're gonna need six to seven billion dollars annually for this fund to be able to continue to meet the success that it has and the pro projection of success that we expect based upon um, how well it has done and, and the ability of so many who have worked to bring families into connectivity that had not previously had it. But the politics are hard. And we heard from the commissioner, this is bipartisan. The legislation to extend it has been bipartisan. The success of the program shows whether it's a Republican district or a Democratic district, people are signing up for this program. So I don't think it's about the program itself, rather I think it's about all the other things that are going on and the things that need funding and that the bigger conversation that's happening in Congress. And as we've seen, it's not incredibly functional at this point. Um, we've had some, some recent disappointments, um, but perhaps this will make it through the process. And I think there's lots of reason to hope for that. And we are continuing to work the Hill to encourage them to do that. And there's been a, a significant effort to engage the households, to inform them, obviously, but also for them to engage directly with their representatives in Congress to support the extension of the program. I, I can't agree more. It's, I, I think it's, it's tragic that uh, we've seen this program uh, steadily increase in enrollment because there's such a great need. Uh, for folks to get support to, um, to access broadband, uh, the number's now up to 23 million. That number is going to hold because the FCC has had to start telling companies that they need to uh, stop signing up people for the ACP program because it's it's about to be shut down. It will be shut down within months. Um, and uh, and given the broad bipartisan support in Congress that we see uh, su supporting renewing the ACP, including uh, this proposal from Senator Welch and Senator Vance and others uh, to simply plus up the money in the program without any reforms to it. Um, uh, it would, it'll be a tragedy if they don't move forward uh, with that bill uh, and, and keep the program from shutting down. Uh, there, uh, you can go all throughout this con conference and find folks who disagree on a number of issues that we'll be talking about, but I don't know anyone who, who disagrees with renewing the money oh. in this program. Um, and it just shows you that uh, uh, the way that Congress is making policy these days uh, is not meeting the needs of the tech sector. Uh, they're not holding hearings uh, enough on this sector. Uh, they're not moving legislation through regular order. Everything's being uh, negotiated largely at the leadership level. Uh, and it leads to this potential tragedy in the coming weeks. So my last uh, position at the FCC was in the Wildline Competition Bureau, uh, and I had the, the responsibility of working on the ACP program as, as well as Lifeline. And, you know, throughout uh, just administration of the program, it, it was clear how successful this program was, how popular this program was on both sides of the aisle. And so it's definitely not the program. You know, there was a recent report that came out that is looking at some of the shortcomings and some things that can be tweaked, but that's the case with almost every program of this nature where you are, uh, you're having a benefit that's helping millions and millions of people. And so, um, you know, doubling down last year uh, on spending $100 million on outreach means or meant uh, that, you know, uh, this, this program is probably, um, you know, in trouble because of its own success spending more money to get more people signed up uh, doing that and then having the money run out. And so uh, we've, I think 
when this came out, it was thought that the appropriation, 14.2 billion was enough to make the program last for five years. Uh, if it goes away in April, that's you know less than three years. It's, it's very much shy of that. And so um, it's, it's sort of inexplicable why we haven't been able to get why we haven't been able to get more money into this program. I think there are some things that can be changed and tweaked and made better, but um, the program is needed, and, and so um, you know, customers and providers alike believe that. Well, this is an issue that we as panelists will all agree on, and maybe the only issue, and that's telling, because I think, as Chris said, I, the challenge is this funding is facing aren't about the merits. I think, I think anyone who works in this field understands this is an incredibly good and sound investment in connectivity and having low income consumers have access to the internet is not a debatable proposition in today's society. But we're dealing with a congressional environment. We're spending billions of dollars when there are competing demands for Ukraine or Israel or border security is obviously a very challenging process. So I don't think this is uh, anyone on the Hill doubting the efficacy of this program so much as just the, the difficulty of enacting spending legislation in this environment. Definitely. Well, I think you all have just hit the nail on the head. Um, I would love to ask you about another um, controversial program. It's controversial in a different way, I guess. Um, let's turn to net neutrality. Up until September, the 2-2 makeup of the commission meant that Democratic leadership couldn't move ahead to restore um, a Title II internet regulation um, regulation treatment, but Chairman, or Chairwoman Rosenworcel then proposed net neutrality restoration rules a day after Commissioner Gomez officially joined the agency. So I think that lands us in a pretty interesting spot, um, including in, like we were talking about, an election year. So um, I would love for all of you to maybe tell me a little bit more about what we can expect as the chairwoman looks to revive the net neutrality rules going forward. And um, maybe you can also explain some of the hurdles that the FCC uh, majority would have to clear before those rules um, do become a reality. Great. Thanks so much. So the way Encompass sees this is net neutrality policy is competition policy. It would set a national framework that ensures that consumers and small businesses can access the online content of their choice without the undue interference from their chosen ISP. Um, so as such, we have filed comments at the FCC and support them moving forward. We understand that the Title II framework really is the only legal basis that the FCC can now exercise in order to institute this national framework. And we're very happy to support their effort to do so. Um, and we believe that it will give consumers, no matter where they live, or where they do their business, the opportunity to have the protections to ensure that they can access that lawful online content that they want to. And what we're seeing is really, you know, so many consumers and small businesses that are relying on streaming services as an alternative to their traditional broadcast or cable television. We're seeing consumers and small businesses also rely a lot more on cloud computing, and there are so many cloud offerings, as well as cloud communication services. So new opportunities for um, consumers and small businesses to use other online platforms in order to, do, to have their connectivity for their voice service, their texting service. And so we do think it is important for the commission to move forward. You asked about the hurdles. Um, so I think it appears that the chairwoman believes she has the votes on the floor, right? And so I fully expect, we, ha we have a full docket already. We've already gone through comments, reply comments, ex parte uh, process has begun. So I fully suspect that the chairwoman will put forward an order in the very you know, near future in order to secure um, the rules for uh, consumers and small businesses as she has proposed in the notice of proposed rulemaking. I have a feeling Matt wants to go next. Well, <laughs> we spiced this up a little. We had our moment of unity, so let's shatter that. <laughs> no, well, th th this is an issue I've been working on for a long, long time. And, you know, we, we sort of go through this in Washington every four years or so. And, and it's worth stepping back and asking, what are we doing? What are we trying to solve? 
and is it on balance going to be a kind of governmental intervention that, that actually contributes more than, than it costs? And I, I think at this point, we have a pretty good experience in the marketplace to know this is not an area where we need FCC uh, common carrier regulation, because on balance, that would impose a lot more harms than benefits. After the commission under Chairman Pai and, and the Restoring Internet Freedom Order repealed the conduct rules, but kept in place the transparency requirements, there were pretty dramatic uh, forecasts of doom. There were, there were statements that the internet was now gonna be delivered one word at a time, the internet was dead and over as we know it, and the sky was falling and a lot of chicken littles um, were out there, and, and you know, I don't think any of that happened. As far as I know, in my own experience as a consumer, my experience in this industry, the internet only got stronger through more investment, got faster, got more reliable. And, and we, we saw incredible challenges during the COVID pandemic with you know, unprecedented spikes in demands and the networks held up remarkably well. And I think proved that we didn't need a heavy handed governmental regime to make the internet function better. Chairwoman Rosa Russell often says we need the internet to be fast and free. It, it is both of those things. It is fast, it is free. So common carrier regulation is something that is not going to make um, the internet better. Regulations have costs and, and common carrier regulation in particular is a framework designed for the 1934 act model of telephone service. It's a poor fit and it, it absolutely impedes investment and it generates the kind of uncertainty that we don't need in an environment where we're asking providers to spend billions of additional dollars alongside government dollars to bridge the digital divide. So solving the major problems we have is not gonna be achieved by this. Um, I'm sure we'll get into the legal merits, but it's also not something that um, the, the commission's gonna be able to do, given the, where the Supreme Court has been, on the Chevron doctrine and where that's likely going and probably more salient is the major questions doctrine where we already had you know, one member of the court, Justice Kavanaugh, when he was on the DC circuit, articulate precisely why this issue cannot be addressed, why Title II cannot be imposed by the FCC consistent with the major questions doctrine. This whole thing is a build up to eventual reversal by the Supreme Court. So it's, it's not a good use of resources. It's a big deterrent to the kind of investments we want to need. And those are some pretty big hurdles. Yes, cool. I'm, I'm hearing that a lot of these hurdles, uh, yeah, could be in the courts. Uh, it sounds like even just that internet performance data that you pointed to um, could be um, you know, used to undermine a potential revival. Um, please go ahead, Chris. I'm just, you know, you missed, Matt, you missed the opportunity to, get, to find unity here. There's broad, broad agreement that there needs to be protection from blocking and throttling, you know, the core net neutrality protections. And, and you know, the marketplace shows why we need it, because it's happening. You know, you can go and find all over the internet uh, examples since the, the rules were repealed about uh, traffic being throttled, about, uh, you talk about it being a pro-competition uh, set of protections, you know, about broadband providers uh, preferencing their own content uh, over competitors, um, uh, the, the public safety concerns, uh, you know, when traffic was throttled during uh, the, the wildfires in California, there's numerous examples of why this protection is needed. And there's broad bipartisan support for it, both out in the public, where it's really not controversial, um, but also, if you believe them, in Congress, where everyone says, well, we should be able to find a way to protect at least those core net neutrality rules. The problem is, is that Congress hasn't been serious about policy making, and so the working groups and all the things they, they have set up have not actually met or held hearings or anything like that. Uh, but you know, you can at least believe them that they say they, they think it can, it can happen. What we're missing here is what was really smart from the chairwoman uh, in this Title II proceeding, is that it's not just about net neutrality. Uh, the uh, the PI uh, FCC not only repealed the net neutrality rules except for the transparency part, uh, but they also said, basically said that the FCC should not have authority over broadband. And that goes far, far more, more important issues than net neutrality are wrapped up in that. And so making sure that the agency actually has authority to deal 
uh, with broadband and consumer protection has to do with the reliability of your broadband networks and whether or not the FCC can get involved with that. It has to do with what Chair uh, Commissioner, I said Chairman, not yet, uh, Commissioner Carr said earlier today that he, he wants to take a market-based approach uh, to looking at the broadband market, but the FCC wouldn't even have the authority to look at the broadband market and come up with any sort of analysis or protections of it. Uh, this is why uh, Chairman Pai, when the pandemic hit, had to go and ask and beg the broadband providers to, uh, to make sure that they continue to give service to folks uh, during the pandemic, uh, because he doesn't have the power to do anything else, to create rules. So um, consumers get it. They want a cop on the beat. Um, and you know, hopefully Chair Rosenworcel will, will move forward with that and, and set up for the agency to look past net neutrality to universal service, to the reliability issues, to the public safety issues that the agency should be looking at as the consumer protection agency over broadband and communications networks. So Chris, you bring up a really interesting point and, and that kind of gets to another question I wanted to ask on the topic of net neutrality which is how is the conversation different this time around? Um, I really like what you just said, how net neutrality in some ways this time is not about net neutrality. It's about all of these, these other follow-on issues um, that kind of flow from it. Um, I would love to, to let you jump in here, Diane. No, it's okay. I, in fact, I, I'm not gonna repeat what, what everyone has already said. I, I, I will say that I think Matt did a, a good job of, of, of articulating what the challenges are going to be for this Commission this time around. Um, at the same time, you know, like you, Matt, I've been working on these issues since 2004, when uh, when uh, Chairman Powell came up with his Internet Principles. Um, I don't think there is a, a ton of fundamental difference about what we all want the Internet to be. We all use it. We all want it to be fast, free. Uh, we want to be able to search for what we'd like to without our provider determining what we can uh, search for, how fast we can get it. All of those are things that, that I think people fundamentally agree on. The issue, again, is how to achieve that. This time uh, around, the conversations are different uh, because the chairwoman decided instead of just, as you said, Chris, instead of just talking about uh, net neutrality, um, she brought in a lot of other uh, principles that um, the claim is that without Title II authority, uh, we can't protect the internet from uh, national security, law enforcement won't have the tools that they need. Uh, you know, on, on, again, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to stay down the middle and not debate either side, because only because I think it, it, it's sort of beside the point when you look through a broader lens at this proceeding. The fact is that uh, with each change of administration, there's been a change in the approach to trying to achieve internet freedom. And there's something fundamentally unfortunate about that. I think if Congress could uh, make a decision about how much authority the FCC should have to uh, regulate the internet and uh, its use by consumers and access by consumers, that would go a long way to uh, prevent sort of the whiplash that we keep going through. And, and so honestly, at the end of the day, I think that's the solution that would be best uh, for all of us. It's a long slog ahead, like your firm, my firm is representing folks involved in this, in this proceeding. Um, I have personal views which are not relevant to this conversa conversation. Um, but I will say the, 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 uh, cal the other calculus that's changed, which uh, Matt talked about a little bit, has to do with where the courts are. Uh, it's a very different world with regard to deference to agencies than it was just a mere four years ago. Um, the, the, I don't think the FCC can depend on uh, getting uh, the benefit of the doubt this time around. And so it, it makes it a lot harder uh, to make the, to change the, the, the decisions that were made a few years ago and to move forward on a different path. It's a very interesting point about that evolution in the courts and how that um, affects agency rulemakings in, in maybe some ways that we haven't seen going forward. Um, Angie, I think you wanted to add something. Yeah, I did. So last week was the 28th birthday of the 1996 Telecommunications Act, which did significantly amend Title II. 
Um, and allowed for the entry of new competitors to offer local telecommunications services, including by large cable companies and small cable companies, to ultimately offer alternative services to what was largely a monopoly uh, market in a mar monopoly marketplace. And I think it's really important to look at that and also think about the larger context in which the chairwoman. Um, has positioned the MPRM and how it is different this time around as compared to the effort under then Chairman Wheeler. And, and that is because it's not just in response to the DC Circuit who told then Chairman Wheeler and the FCC commissioners that the only way to really do this is via Title II, but rather within the context of COVID has changed everything. So much so we have a Congress that has allocated close to $100 billion through several congressional pieces of legislation to say everyone needs to get connected. We need network access to everyone and it needs to be affordable. Well, in order for that to happen, we need the Title II functionality and protections that the FCC can exercise and she has teed that up in this NPRM. As I had referenced earlier, the need to access to polls in conduit today, that's really only available to those who offer a telecommunications service or offer a cable video service. So by clarifying that broadband internet access service is also a telecom service, this is now going to allow for the many providers that only offer broadband service to get non-discriminatory access to polls conduit, to get the same protections that the commission affords access to consumers and small businesses in multi-tenant environments that Commissioner Carr discussed in his remarks. So, the FCC exercising its rightful oversight and authority over broadband internet access service is critical to ensuring that consumers not only get access, but also that they have choice. That network choice is really important to be driving competitive opportunities, which we know helps drive more innovation and investment as well as affordability. This is one of the reasons why Encompass for over a decade has supported the commission using the authority that it has to have this oversight and ensure that every American has the opportunity to be connected to the highest speed um, network availability, as well as the opportunity to choose their network provider. Well, I think we could talk about net neutrality all day. Matt, do you want to just cap yeah, off those just, remarks? Just one, one quick thing, because I think um, I was noting Chris earlier was talking about a cop on the beat, and um, one part of this debate that that I think is getting a little lost sometimes too is that the Federal Trade Commission is a pretty important cop on the beat and an aggressive one these days. And I think Chris, you also mentioned, and Angie also mentioned privacy. Um, this Title II proposal would would severely undercut privacy for two reasons. One is the Federal Trade Commission doesn't have jurisdiction over common carriers, so. A, Title II classification removes the FTC's jurisdiction and takes broadband out of the, that holistic oversight of the internet ecosystem, which really doesn't make any sense at all. Um, and two, Chris, you alluded earlier to the congressional rejection of the 2016 FCC broadband order. Under the Correct Congressional Resolution Act, that means the FCC cannot reinstate that broadband privacy order. So if it goes forward with Title II, the commission won't have the ability to adopt broadband specific privacy rules, which would mean creating a gigantic void, a privacy void. I mean, most of us think there ought to be some kind of national legislative framework dealing with internet privacy. But until we have that, this would actually detract from oversight by eliminating again FTC oversight and preventing the FCC from taking further action. Well, let's move on. Oh, sorry. You guys should do a privacy <laughs> panel because no, really, the overlap of privacy in telecom and privacy at the FTC where there are no current privacy rules. They just say, are you following the rules that you created for yourself or not? It's not much of a regime. Uh, it's why they, everyone at the FTC wants a comprehensive privacy law. You know, I mean, there's, you could do a whole panel on that. And just one final word, because there are privacy laws out there in this, at the state level, and that's a whole other conversation about do we want 50 different regimes uh, and so this 
Yeah, I'll stop there. It's a whole panel. <laughs> well, I think this you you all are hitting on something that that makes me find um, just covering telecom so interesting. There's so much interplay between these issues. You can't possibly silo net neutrality without talking about privacy, without talking about broadband deployment. And I, I think that's why we all are like drawn to this. It's it's very intersectional, and all of these issues like affect each other. Um, so I would love to talk about another one of these like pretty messy policy issues, which is the um, digital discrimination order. Um, this has been generating, if not as much heat as net neutrality, maybe possibly more heat in, in some circles. Um, so I'd love to kind of break down what's happening here. Um, this order was adopted in November. Importantly for our discussion, the agency adopted a disparate impact standard um, for judging when a company's policies and practices are impeding fair broadband access. Um, and this is now being contested in the courts. So um, Matt, I would love to maybe throw it to you to kind of summarize where we're at in um, this um, lawsuit cycle um, over the FCC's order. And um, also feel free to correct me if uh, you don't think I summarized that correctly. Yeah, I mean, this is another one of these issues where I think it's unfortunate because there are some really important things the FCC is charged with doing and should be doing, but it has overreached and gone well beyond its its legal authority. And I think that's just going to end in a lot of unnecessary litigation and, and, and probably a real setback for the FCC in this arena. So the, the statute uh, that we're talking about is Section 60506 of the Infrastructure Act. It was a small part of this massive legislation that created billions of dollars in funding. We talked about ACP and the BEAD program. Um, and it appropriately, with the support of clients like mine who are in the broadband industry, um, prohibited what was often called redlining, but here was called digital discrimination. And there's a straightforward textual provision that says that the FCC shall adopt rules prohibiting digital discrimination. The problem the commission is facing is that that phrase uh, prohibiting discrimination has a long history in the courts and civil rights uh, contexts like employment and housing, and it means an intentional discrimination or disparate treatment standard. And uh, the Supreme Court has weighed in on this repeatedly, a leading case is called inclusive communities, and there are certain magic words that Congress would have had to have used if it wanted to legislate um, that the FCC deal with the effects of discrimination, and, and Congress did not do that. And this interpretation by the FCC imposing a disparate impact standard is unique because it applies uh, not simply to race or other traditionally protected classifications, but to income. And if you think about what a disparate impact standard means applied to income, it is truly radical because if a broadband provider charges a uniform price, let's say $75 a month, that is now unlawful if it has a disparate impact based on income and can't be justified by economic or technical infeasibility of, of, of having pursuing some alternative. You know, a, a uniform price is always going to have a disparate impact based on income because people of lower means, you know, have have more difficulty affording it. And the FCC similarly mentioned credit checks. Well, credit checks disparately impact people with bad credit who have low income. So the the problem with this overreach is it sets up a completely unworkable standard that cannot be justified in the courts. So so my I represent four uh, state broadband associations that have challenged this order. Friday afternoon, this is all breaking news, the judicial uh, panel on multi-district litigation consolidated all the appeals, which include um, petitions that were filed in six circuits in total. Those are now consolidated in the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. So that, that case will go forward um, imminently, and um, I do think the commission is going to have a very difficult time justifying this unprecedented disparate impact regime. I will just add that I, I think there was a missed opportunity here because if you look at Section 60506 and, and what the Commission was charged with doing, uh, it was also about uh, rooting out finding instances of discrimination uh, of access uh, and remediating them, um, figuring out how to uh, get broadband to those places that aren't getting broadband. And I read the Commission's order and there's this you know, there's there's all of this uh, structure in these rules about what to do when it's found, and it sets up uh, what will certainly be uh, instances of, of enforcement action and, and, and other act actions that are taken. Uh, but I don't see much of, if we find that uh, an area is being impacted, uh, either intentionally or through disparate impact, intentional is a whole other issue. You, 
the commission could always do something about that. You could always do something about in intentional. Um, but if, if, if you find uh, uh, that an area is not getting access uh, uh, in, in a way that they should, what's in place? What is the commission going to do about that? What are the steps that the commission is going to do? And I think that was a missed opportunity uh, not to set up, uh, at, at least to give uh, some more uh, meat to what tools the commission already has and, and what they can do in working with the industry and working with these communities to actually remedy the problem. I'm glad to hear you say that, Diane, because that was one of the questions I had after looking through that rulemaking. Um, to me, it did still seem unclear what the uh, enforcement mechanisms would be if um, this um, yeah, disparate impact, I guess, was was found. Um, Chris, it looks like you might have something to add. I, I was going to one agree with Diane. I mean, uh, we were disappointed that there weren't stronger clarity. There wasn't stronger clarity on the enforcement side. Um, that if complaints are brought, uh, if or if they would necessarily be addressed or not, uh, like many other complaint processes. Um, however, I think the thing to celebrate uh, in these rules uh, is that they exist um, at an agency that, but for the infrastructure uh, law. Uh, it was unclear if they would have moved forward this, and, and, I, and I credit Chair Rosenworcel for uh, moving forward expeditiously on a vote that was controversial, uh, because uh, now we have an actual rule that you cannot uh, discriminate in how you deploy your networks to specific neighborhoods, and that's incredibly important. It what it, you know, it, the, the 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 point that Matt made about pricing, um, you know, uh, my understanding of it is that uh, when you look at the studies. Uh, of uh, folks who were having their neighborhoods overlooked. Um, they were often being asked to pay the same price for uh, an inferior product. Uh, maybe they still have dial-up or DSL uh, when a wealthier neighborhood uh, nearby has high-speed fiber that has you know gigabit speeds. But the, the, the price is being advertised look different. And then sometimes you saw neighborhoods where not only were the networks not being upgraded, but uh, uh, but they weren't even in the plans for, for uh, companies to roll out broadband to. Um, how do we do this? And what studies I'm talking about? Well, they were led by civil society groups, some of our allies uh, who have people on the ground studying these marketplaces. It wasn't because the FCC studied it. That's not why Congress put this in there. Um, uh, and and so it just goes to show you that when you don't have an agency with authority to look at the broadband market, then there, you're missing uh, a huge part of what's causing the digital divide and that some neighborhoods were just being passed by. So shout out to the National Digital Inclusion Alliance who did the first of those studies. Um, others in California, Green Lining Institute, um, NDIA is having their conference tomorrow, the largest digital equity conference in the country. Uh, with folks who are on the ground who see the impacts of digital redlining, um, and they will be celebrating these rules. Um, and uh, you know, we have a long, long path to go in the courts. Um, there's a number of challenges, and we'll see where they go. Uh, and I'm concerned about them. But at its core, uh, the FCC should have the right to make sure that it can meet its universal service uh, goals and obligations by making sure that uh, passing over low-income neighborhoods or communities of color is simply illegal. Can I, just one quick thing, because I want to stick up for my clients who are cable operators. Cable operators have been building out under a principle of universal service throughout their existence. And, and part of that is because of the Title VI laws around franchising. Cable franchise agreements have always required cable operators um, to build out in a non-discriminatory manner and have prohibited redlining for, for, for decades. So, and I can't speak for overbuilders who may have chosen to build in, in one area versus another, but the, the cable companies that I am representing um, have not overlooked communities. The statistics that we put in the record of the FCC's proceeding bear this out. Communities of color have access at as high or higher rates to the fastest speeds that are being offered, the gigabit speeds. Um, and there, there was simply no evidence of discrimination, and the commission agreed with that uh, in its order. So our concern is not that we want to defend practices of building unequally, quite the contrary. I mean, my clients are committed to building equally and being subject to non-discrimination rules. The problem is that disparate impact can really have unintended consequences that, like the Title II proceeding, are going to end up deterring building, deterring investment, and leading to a lot of legal uncertainty that isn't going to advance the ball. 
Just one other point. Yes, so let me um, just briefly say we have um, the five minute warning. So let's um, try to wrap it up, but yes, please, Diane. I, I will be quick and just say that I, I, I wanna be clear. Um, I, I think that there are some huge challenges for this order and the way it was implemented. Um, I, I agree with, with Matt and with what the commission said. There's really uh, not a lot of evidence out there. Um, and I, I think this, uh, some parts of this item will be a distraction and will sort of keep, uh, take the focus off of making sure that broadband is, is, is getting to the places where it needs to get. So um, I, I, I think it's a tough road ahead on this item for the FCC. Wonderful. Well, um, I think that's probably uh, all the time we have today. I would love to continue picking your brains about what's happening with USF contribution reform, uh, but unfortunately, I think that will take us uh, far over time. So let's leave it there for today. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to our wonderful panelists, and thank you all for listening. It's great having you.